Our dear Father in heaven, thank you again. You love us and uh, you have given us everything that is needful for our salvation. And Lord, we pray that um, we may represent thee fully in this mortal life that we have, that we may be able, Lord, to attain to immortal life. And so continue guiding us even as we look into these um, sessions that we are having on the prophets and the messengers. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And uh, so uh, I'm, I'm glad then that uh, we, we can share in these presentations. Just uh, finished on uh, an appeal to common sense. And uh, I want to go a little bit into Adventist history and uh, looking into the G. White biography. Uh, I just want to say thank you to Brother Paul Chung for providing the photo in color. That photo is on, on my which side is that on the left side that photo is always in black but uh, he has been able to change it into color um and so thank you brother paul for that and uh i want to look into a white biography and uh, some subsequent uh, encounters that she had when uh, she was alive just a peep into the background and looking at her life and what she had to encounter and um uh, there is a lot to be talked about, and uh, I wouldn't want to dwell so much on the history that uh, maybe people may be knowing. There are some questions and controversies that have been uh, raised, and uh, I'd like to deal with a few of them uh, in this presentation so that uh, we may be educated. And uh, in this presentation, this is uh, number 25 in the Prophets and the Messengers, E.G. White uh, Biography Part 1. And this is a synopsis of the Great Controversy. We know uh, that there have been questions raised on the book, uh, The Great Controversy itself. And I just want us to look at it uh, as the Lord will guide us. Great Controversy 1858, 1884, 1888, and 1911 edition. Um, how it all began. Uh, the background for that uh, extraordinary meeting was uh, the vision God gave Ellen White on Sunday afternoon, March 1858, in Lovett's Grove, Ohio. She and James had met with several scattered groups of Sabbath-keeping Adventists throughout the state. In uh, fact, for two weeks, her brother and sister Tillotson Tilo drove their horse-drawn carriage to take the whites to where the various small groups of Sabbath keepers held their meetings in uh, Green Springs, Gilboa, and Lovett's Grove. On Sabbath, March 13, as well as Sunday morning, meetings were held in a schoolhouse just north of Bowling Green, Ohio. Besides the estimated 14 individuals who had accepted the Sabbath in Lovett's Grove, Others also were in attendance both days. Sunday afternoon found James and Ellen White back at the same schoolhouse where Elder White conducted the funeral for a young man who had died. Upon completion of the service, Miss White stood to offer a few words of encouragement to the mourners. As she talked about the resurrection at Christ's coming and the cheering hope of Christian of the Christian, she would later recall my soul triumphed in God. I drank in rich droughts of uh, salvation. Heaven, sweet heaven, was the magnet to draw my soul upward, and I was wrapped up in a vision of God's glory. During the two-hour vision, God revealed a number of things to Ellen White, including what we now call the Great Controversy. And th that is uh, the background information about um, the great controversy that um, uh, we have in print. And uh, there have been uh, various editions and uh, controversies have been there, why the changes have been made. But um, uh, I also want to point you to the preface of uh, the great controversy uh, the GC, uh, sorry, 
that is um, the preface for 1888 edition, there are people who have gone through this. And uh, it is just something so amazing to go through the 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 the, 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 the preface of the great controversy. Now, if uh, you will afford me to read some parts of it, if not of all, um, I'll be able to read. It is just a, something same amazing, and those who have not. Uh, been able to go through it, you can bear witness when you shall hear about it that uh, it is one of the most uh, amazing uh, preface or uh, author's, author's notes that uh, you will ever find for a book or uh, 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 of a book. Now, I'll, uh, I'll try to bring some highlights of this. Before the entrance of sin, she says, Adam enjoyed open communion with his maker, but since man separated himself from God by transgression, the human race has been cut off from his high privilege. By the plan of redemption, however, a way has been opened whereby the inhabitants of the earth may still have connection with heaven. God has communicated with men by his spirit and divine light has been imparted to the world by revelations to his chosen servants. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. During the first 2,500 years of human history, there was no written revelation. Those who had been taught of God communicated their knowledge to others, and it was handed down from father to son through successive generations. The preparation of the written word began in the times of Moses. Inspired revelations were then embodied in an inspired book. This work continued during the long period of 1,600 years from Moses, the historian of creation and the law, to join the record of the most sublime true truths of the gospel. The Bible points to God as its author, yet it was written by human hands, and in the varied style of its different books, it is it presents the character, characteristics of the several writers. The truths revealed are all given by the inspiration of God to Timothy 3.16, yet they are expressed in the words of men. The infinite one, by his, by his Holy Spirit has shed light into the minds and hearts of his servants. He has given dreams and visions, symbols and figures, and those to whom the truth was thus revealed have themselves embodied the thought in human language. And I was able to deal with this issue of uh, thought inspiration versus verbal inspiration. How did God work with his prophets? Uh, we are told, the Ten Commandments were spoken by God himself and were written by his own hand. They are of divine and not human composition. But the Bible, with its God-given truth expressed in the language of man, presents a union of the divine and the human. Such a union existed in the nature of Christ, who was the Son of God and the Son of Man. Thus, it is true of the Bible, as it was of Christ, that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among, among us. Now, think about that, that sublime thought. Thus, it is true of the Bible as it was of Christ that the word was made flesh and dwelt among men, John 1, 14. And what is she alluding to? The two natures of Christ, the divine nature and the human nature, the divine son of God and the son of man. Now, when you come to the Bible, it is a divine revelation written by human beings so it is a divine human book it has two natures that is the divine and the human and uh, it is so sublime that um, uh, 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 god would like to demonstrate his divinity through human instrumentalities that is uh, a amazing thought to just think about that uh, as the Bible is, so is Christ. Christ having two natures and the Bible having it is two natures. Uh, as that thought hit my mind, I thought that that was so wonderful to think about. Written in different ages by men who differed widely in rank and occupation and in mental and spiritual endowments, the books of the Bible present a wide contrast in style as well as diversity in the nature of the subjects unfolded. Um, different forms of expression are employed by different writers. Often the same truth is more strikingly presented by one than by another. And as several writers present a subject 
under varied aspects and relations, there may appear to the superficial careless or prejudiced reader to be discrepancy or contradiction, where the thoughtful, reverent student with clear insight discerns the underlying harmony. As presented through different individuals, the truth is brought out in its varied aspects. One writer is most strongly impressed with one face of a subject. He grasps those points that harmonize with his, his experience or with his power of perception and appreciation. Another seizes upon a different face and each under the guidance of the Holy Spirit presents what is most possible impression, impressed, what is most possibly impressed upon his own mind. A different aspect of the truth in each, but a perfect harmony through all. And the truth thus revealed unite to form a perfect whole adapted to meet the wants of men in all the circumstances and experiences of life. God has been pleased to communicate his truth to the world by human agencies and he himself, by his Holy Spirit, not by another being, qualified men and enabled them to do this work. He guided the mind in the selection of what to speak and what to write. The treasures was entrusted to earth and vessels, yet it is nonetheless from heaven. The testimony is conveyed through the uh, imperfect expression of human language, yet it is the testimony of God and the obedient believing child of God beholds in it the glory of a divine power full of grace and truth. In his word, God has com committed to men the knowledge necessary for salvation. The Holy Scriptures are to be accepted as an authoritative infallible revelation of his will. They are the standard of character, the revealer of doctrines, and the test of experience. Every scripture inspired of God is also profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction which is in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, furnished completely unto every good work. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, Revised Edition. Yet, the fact that God has revealed his will to men through his word has not rendered needless the continued presence and guiding of the Holy Spirit. And so, even though we have the Bible, the Holy Spirit uh, has not been rendered needless. We need the guiding of the Holy Spirit to even understand that which the Holy Spirit led to be authored. On the contrary, the Spirit was promised by our Savior to open the word to his servants, to illuminate and apply its teachings. And since it was the Spirit of God that inspired the Bible, it is impossible that the teaching of the Spirit should ever be contrary of that of the word. The Spirit was not given, nor can it ever be bestowed to supersede the Bible, for the Scripture explicitly states that the word of God is the standard by which all teaching and experience must be tested. Says the says the apostle john believe not every spirit but try the spirit where they are of god because many false prophets are gone out in the world one john 4 1 and isaiah declares to the law and to the testimony if they speak not according to this word it is because there is no light in them isaiah 8 20 great reproach has been cast upon the work of their holy spirit great reproach by the errors of a class that claiming it is enlightenment profess to have no further need of guidance from the word of god now you hear people that i have the spirit i don't need the word the spirit is the one guiding me and so i do not need the bible they are governed by impression which they, which they regard as the voice of god in the soul but the spirit that controls them is not the spirit of god this following of Impressions to the neglect of the scriptures can lead only to confusion, to deception, and ruin. It serves only to further the designs of the evil one, since the ministry of the Holy Spirit is of vital importance to the church of Christ. It is one of the devices of Satan through the errors of extremists and fanatics to cast contempt upon the work of the Spirit and cause the people of God to neglect this source of strength which our Lord himself has provided. In harmony with the word of God, his spirit was to continue it is work throughout the entire period of the gospel dispensation. During the ages while the scriptures of both the Old and the New Testament were being given, the Holy Spirit did not cease to communicate light to individual minds, apart from the revelations to be embodied in the sacred canon. The Bible itself relates how, through the Holy Spirit, men received warning, reproof, counsel, and instruction in matters in no way relating to the giving of the scriptures. 
And uh, mention is made of prophets in different ages of whose utterances nothing is recorded. In like manner, after the close of the canon scripture, the Holy Spirit was still to continue at his work to enlighten, warn, and comfort the children of God. Albeit, it had to be subject to the word of God. Jesus promised his disciples the comforter which is the Holy Ghost whom the Father will send in my name he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I have said unto you. When he the spirit of truth is come he will guide you into all truth and he will show you things to come. John 14:26 and 16:13. Scripture plainly teaches that these promises so far from being limited to apostolic days extend to the church of Christ in all ages. The Savior assures his followers I am with you all the way even unto the end of the world. Now, you, you can see how E.G. White uses the promise of the Holy Spirit and John 28, 20. That uh, this spirit that is to come, it is the Savior with his followers all the way even unto the end of the world. And so you can never miss that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. It is his special omnipresence. It's the omnipresence of the Father. And uh, this is a linkage between John 14, John 16, and Matthew chapter 28. And Paul declares that uh, the gifts and the manifestations of the Spirit were set in the church for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come into or in the unity of faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stage of the fullness of Christ, Ephesians 4, 12, and 13. For the believers at Ephesus, the apostle prayed that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that ye may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us word who believe Ephesians 1, 17 to 19. The ministry of the divine spirit is enlightening the understanding and opening to the mind the deep things of God's holy word was the blessing which Paul thus besought for the Ephesian church. After the wonderful manifestation of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, Peter exhorted the people to repentance and baptism in the name of Christ for the remission of their sins, and he said, Ye shall receive the Holy Spirit you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Acts 2, 38 and 39. In immediate connection with the sins of the great day of God, the Lord by the prophet Joel has promised a special manifestation of his spirit. Joel 2, 28. This prophecy received a partial fulfillment in the outpouring of the spirit on the day of Pentecost but it will reach its full accomplishment in the manifestation of divine grace which will attend the closing work of the gospel. The great controversy between good and evil will increase in intensity to the very close of time. In all ages, the wrath of Satan has been manifested against the church of Christ, and God has bestowed his grace and spirit upon his people to strengthen them to stand against the power of the evil one. When the apostles of Christ were to bear his gospel to the world and to record it for all future ages, they were especially endowed with the enlightenment of the Spirit. But as the church approaches her final deliverance, Satan is to work with greater power. He comes down having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. Revelation 12.12 12. He will work with all power in signs and lying wonders. 2 Thessalonians 2.9 for 6,000 years, that mastermind that once was highest among the angels of God has been wholly bent to the work of deception and ruin. And all the depths of satanic skill and subtlety acquired, all the cruelty developed during these struggles of the ages will be brought to bear against God's people in the final conflict. And in this time of peril, the followers of Christ are to bear, the are to, bear to the world the warning of the Lord's second advent, and a people are to be prepared to stand before him at his coming, without spot and blameless, 2 Peter 3.14. At this time, the special endowment of divine grace and power is not less needful to the church than in apostolic day, which means that the closing work will be attended with a greater manifestation than when the work began. 
Through the illumination of the Holy Spirit, the scenes of the long continued conflict between good and evil have been opened to the right of these pages. Now she goes to talk about how she came up with the great controversy because we are looking at uh, E.G. White's biography and uh, uh, the synopsis of the great controversy, the book, the great controversy, and the whole picture of the great controversy, not only the book itself. And so she says, through the illumination of the Holy Spirit, the sins of the long continued conflict between good and evil have been opened to the right of these pages. That is E.G. White. From time to time, I have been permitted to behold the working in different ages of the great controversy between Christ, the Prince of Light, the oath of our salvation and Satan, the prince of evil, the oath of sin, the first transgressor of God's holy law. Satan's enmity against Christ has been manifested against his followers. The same hatred of the principles of God's law, the same policy of deception by which error is made to appear as truth, by which human laws are substituted for the law of God, and men are led to worship the creature rather than the creator, may be traced in all the history of the past. Satan's effort to misrepresent the character of God to cause men to cherish a false conception of the creator and thus to regard him with fear and hate rather than with love is his endeavors to set aside the divine law, leading the people to think themselves free from its requirements and his persecution of those who dare to resist his deceptions have been steadfastly pursued in all ages. They may be traced in the history of patriarchs, prophets, and apostles, of martyrs, and reformers. In the great final conflict, Saturn will employ the same policy, manifest the same spirit, and work for the same end as in all preceding ages. That which has been will be, except that the coming struggle will be marked with a terrible intensity such as the world has never witnessed. Saturn's deceptions will be more subtle, his assaults were more determined. If it were possible, he will lead astray the elect. Mark 13, 22. As the Spirit of God has opened to my mind the great truth of his word and the sins of the past and the future have been hidden to make known to others what has thus been revealed, to trace the history of the controversy in past ages and especially to so present it as to shed a light on the fast approaching struggle of the future. In pursuance of this purpose, I have endeavored to select and group together events in the history of the church in such a manner as to trace the unfolding of the great testing truths that at different periods have been given to the world that have exerted the wrath of Satan and the enmity of a world-loving church and that have been maintained by the witness of those who love not their lives unto death. In these records, we may see a foreshadowing of the conflict before us. Regarding them in the light of God's word and by the illumination of his spirit, we may see unveiled the devices of the wicked one and the dangers which they must shun who will be found without fault before the Lord at his coming. The great events which have marked the progress of reform in past ages are matters of history, well known and universally acknowledged by the Protestant world. They are facts which none can gainsay. This history I have presented briefly in accordance with the scope of the book and the brevity which must necessarily be observed. The facts having been condensed into a little space has seemed consistent with a proper understanding of their application. In some cases where a historian has so grouped together events as to afford in brief a comprehensive view of the subject or has summarized details in a convenient manner, his words have been quoted. But except in a few instances, no specific credit has been given since they are not quoted for the purpose of citing that writer as authority, but because his statement affords a ready and forcible presentation of the subject. In narrating the experience and views of those carrying forward the work of reform in our own time, similar use has occasionally been made of their published uh, work. And then she closes by saying, it is not so much the object of this book to present new truths concerning the struggles of former times as to bring out facts and principles which have a bearing upon coming events. Yet viewed as a part of the controversy between the forces of light and darkness, all these records of the past are seen to have a new significance and through them a light is cast upon the future, illumining the pathway of those who, like the reformers of past ages, will be called even at the peril of all earthly good witness for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. 
to unfold the scenes of the great controversy between truth and error to reveal the wiles of Saturn and the means by which he may be successfully resisted, to present a satisfactory solution of the great problem of evil, shedding such a light upon the origin and the final disposition of sin as to fully make manifest the justice and the benevolence of God in all his dealings with his creatures, and to show the holy and changing nature of his law is the object of this book that through its influence souls may be delivered from the power of darkness and become partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Two, the praise of him who loved us and gave himself for us is the earnest prayer of the writer E.G. White, Hildesburg, California. And so that is the author's preface of the great controversy. And we have had different editions of this book, but why have these different books? And so after giving that um, author's preface, uh, I want to just um, go through the great controversy of 1858, 1884 to 1888 and 1911. And um, although much of what she was shown had been revealed to her 10 years earlier, she was now instructed to write it out. As the mourners bore the body of the deceased to the graveyard, Ellen White said of those still at the schoolhouse, great solemnity rested upon those who remained. Was the solemnity caused by having seen Miss White in vision for two hours or because she had, she also told something about what she had just shown? Unfortunately, one can only speculate since she does not say. Her son, who was not with his parents on this trip, but uh, doubtless heard the story from them, will later write. The large congregation which had more than filled the schoolhouse returned to their homes, saying, we have seen strange things today. The following day, Monday, the Tillot sons drove James and uh, Ellen White to Fremont, Ohio. On Tuesday, the Whites took the train to Jackson, Michigan, about 47 miles east of uh, Battle Creek, and the Tillot sons returned our Tilo sons returned to their home in Green Springs, Ohio. As the white travels on the train, as the whites traveled on the train, Miss White apparently described to her husband what she had been shown two days before. Believing the vision important enough to distribute widely, they made plans for her to write out the great controversy portion of it immediately upon their return home to Battle Creek and for James then to publish it. Admiral's review, March. Um, 1828. Uh, and uh, it is uh, it is uh, speculated that uh, E.G. White had a vision. And in some other places herself in her biography, she'll uh, tell you that uh, uh, the devil wanted to finish her when uh, or to kill her when uh, she started writing uh, the great controversy, but uh, the Lord uh, preserved uh, her, her life. Continued on, and this is in Life Sketches page, uh, in Life Sketches page 162 to 163, what I'm just saying, attacked by the devil. Two days afterward, while journeying on the cars to Jackson, Michigan, we arranged our plans for writing and publishing. Immediately on our return home, the book entitled The Great Controversy Between Christ and His Angels and Saturn and His Angels. It is interesting what is the title of this book. Very interesting what is the title of this book. And uh, I just have to put this on the screen. Two days after word, while journeying on the cars to Jackson, Michigan, we arranged our plans for writing and publishing. Immediately on our return home, the book entitled The Great Controversy Between Christ and His Angels and Saturn and His Angels, commonly known as Spiritual Gifts, Volume 1, I was then as well as usual. On the arrival of the train at Jackson, we went to Brother Palmas. We had been in the house but a short time when, as I was conversing with Sister Palma, my tongue refused to utter what I wished to say and seemed large and numb. A strange cold sensation struck my heart, passed over my head and down by and down my right side. For a time I was insensible but was aroused by the voice of earnest prayer. I tried to use my left limbs 
left arm and limb second spirit two uh, spiritual gifts volume 2 page 271 but they were perfectly useless for a short time i did not expect to live it was my third shock of paralysis and although within 50 miles of home I did not expect to see my children again. I, she says, hold on a minute. I called to my mind, I called to, my, to mind the triumphant season I had enjoyed at Lovett's Grove and thought it was my last testimony and felt reconciled to die. And so this, this, this was the situation that uh, she went through, um, as um, she was at uh, Palmer's house and wanted to say something, but then she was struck by um, paralysis. And then here in Kolpotua Ministry, page 127, paragraph one, she let us say the great controversy should be very should be very widely circulated. It contains the story of the past, the present, and the future. In it is in in it is outline of the closing scenes of this earth history. It bears a powerful testimony in behalf of the truth. I am more anxious to see a wide circulation of this book than for any others I have written. For in the great controversy, the last message of warning to the world is given more distinctly than in any of my other books. Now, talking about uh, the great controversy being of the heavenly origin in Col Fortua Ministry, page 128, paragraph 3, she says, The book, The Great Controversy, I appreciate above silver or gold, and uh, I greatly desire that it shall come before the people. While writing the manuscript of The Great Controversy, I was often conscious of the presence of the angels of God. Many times the scenes about which I was writing were presented to me anew in visions of the night so that they were fresh and vivid in my mind. Th this is the place that people read and say, now Sister White is not talking the truth because uh, we know that she took uh, a lot of material from historians. But then they forget the preface of the great controversy itself where she said that um, she, she took materials from the historians because they could illustrate what she wanted to say better and she did not cite because the authority did not lie in the author of those books but the one who gave the message and so while she says that the scenes were brought to her afresh she is just um, uh, trying to emphasize how the history was made vivid on her mind that what she was speaking was actually the right representation of uh, the thing, or it presented a better uh, scope of what uh, she was writing at that time. And so she should not be accused of plagiarism when in the preface, she says that she borrowed this material and she could not cite, not because she did not want to cite, but because the power did not lie in the authors of this history, but the one who gave them the message for uh, writing down. And so many times the scenes about which I was writing were presented to me anew in visions of the night so that they were fresh and vivid in my mind. Letter 56, 19, 11, also in Kolpotua Ministry, page 128, paragraph 3. Uh, repeatedly over the years, since 1858, Saturn has worked to eliminate that book. At Jackson, he tried a physical attack. Now she talks about the attack by Saturn at uh, Jackson House being uh, uh, um, in connection with her not being uh, uh, producing that, uh, with her not Saturn wanting her to produce that book. And so at Jackson, he tried a physical attack. But since then, he has worked through men to accomplish the same effect. There will be so many meetings to attend that uh, she will not have time to write the book in 1860 to 1870s. Scorn, insults, and false accusations will be poured upon her to force her to give up trying to write the 1884 edition or later enlarge it into the 1888 edition in 1880s. The book is too long. We want shorter books at the review. Make it shorter, she was told in 1885 to 1887. Because she will not return royalties to the review, that was used as an excuse for not circulating the book in 1888 to 1890. There are other books which will sell better, so we'll leave that one 
on the publishing house shelves was the policy decided on 1888 to 1890 and later. Some other people probably wrote the later editions, so have nothing to do with the 1888 or 1911 edition. That is um, in 1970s and onward, and uh, we shall see how they, we have been given the great hope instead of the great controversy, which some others call the great hoax. The early editions are not officially approved today, so do not circulate them and will keep the current edition so highly priced you can afford it. That is 1950s and onward. People just talking about things about this great controversy. Everything in that book was copied from someone else, so the book is worthless, 1970s and onward. And then we could hear statements like, the book could get us into trouble with the Sunday-keeping churches, so do not distribute it, 1950s and onward. You, you see excuses and excuses of um, having this book out. That book should never be distributed first, always later, much later, 1950s and onward. It is too hard a book to sell. The children's books are better, 1950s and onward. Yes, I have the book at home on my bookshelf. No, I, I am so busy with other things that I haven't read it in, in it for years. But yes, I do think it is very important. And so a lot of excuses is given for either not reading the book, either not supplying it, either not producing other printouts, even hindering those who would want to print it, to print it and uh, are trying to apply copyright on it. When actually um, it is the book she said that it should go before the people as uh, we will uh, uh, circulate the autumn leaves. And um, in uh, in, uh, in the review of um, in the review June 24, 1858, we read the following notice of publication appeared in June 1858 review, The Great Controversy. This is the title of the work now in the press written by Miss White. It is a sketch of her visions, her views of the great Controversy between Christ and his angels and the devil and his angels from the fall of Saturn until the controversy shall close at the end of the of the 1,000 years of Revelation. Uh, that is Revelation um, 20, I believe. By the destruction of sin and sinners out of the universe of God. It will contain between two and 300 pages price neatly bound in Muslim of 15 send uh this is the first book purpose for the 1884 edition what was the purpose of the 1884 edition a letter by james white revealed that in mid-january 1879 ellen began work on the enlarged great controversy this work was primarily done in two ways one she was shown in brief flashbacks while writing portions of the 1858 vision which were not as clear in her mind and had therefore not been included in earlier presentations too, she was given additional material in new visions. She was also instructed that as she searched other bio biographical accounts, especially on the life of Christ, she would recognize worthwhile ways to express her ideas in a fuller, pleasing variety. And as she read through the writings of church historians, she would locate and date scenes she had been shown in vision. This she did. As additional light was given regarding the great controversy, she was instructed that uh, she would write it out. This she faithfully did. That is how the 1884 edition came to be. Later still, the same procedure produced the 1888 edition. Each one was an enlargement of the one before it. Each one was therefore important. Yet the publication of a new edition did not negate the importance of the previous one. So. Uh, there was a showing in brief flashbacks uh, while writing in 1858. And uh, in uh, and later, she was uh, given additional material in New Visions. Now, in uh, Notes and Papers, page 164, also in uh, Selected Messages, book uh, 3, page 437, these are the points we note about uh, E.G. White herself. 
And uh, Willie White says, Mother has never claimed to be authority on history. The things which she has written out are descriptions of flashlight pictures and other representations given her regarding the actions of men and the influence of this action upon the work of God for the salvation of men with views of past, present, and future history in its relation to this work. In connection with the writing out of these views, she had made use of good and clear historical statements to help make plain the things which she is endeavoring to present. When I was a mere boy, I had her read D. Obgin's history of the Reformation to my father. And so E.G. White herself was not uh, a historian as we see Willie White uh, confessing, but um, she took readily what was uh, written by these um, historians and uh, put into print as um, to uh, as not to really write as a historian but uh, somebody who had been inspired to pick um, that which um, will assist her in uh, what um, she was writing about and uh, Willie White continues to say, he continues to say, when I was a mere boy, I had her read D. Ogbin's History of Reformation to my father. She read to him a large part, if not the whole, of the five volumes. She has read other histories of the Reformation. This has helped her to locate and describe many of the events and the movements presented to her in vision. This is somewhat similar to the way in which the study of the Bible helps her to locate and describe the many figurative representations given to her regarding the development of the great controversy in our day between truth and error. Willie White on October 30, 1911, statement quoted in notes and uh, uh, papers, page 164, also in three selected messages, page uh, 437. Again, interestingly enough, this trip to Europe was uh, from 1884 to 1888. Interestingly enough, this trip to Europe was very definitely in God's providence. After completing the second edition, the 1884 of the Great Controversy, there was no plan in Ellen's mind that she would ever again redo all that work and enlarge it yet a third time. But arriving in Europe, she met people, saw places, and learned of incidents which firmly convicted her that even though she had already finished an edition of that book, she must do another one. So a sizable amount of that two-year stay in Europe was spent collecting data for a second revision of the book, part of which was completed while there. In addition, she was shown in vision that the great controversy message must be given the widest circulation to those outside the church. This intensified her conviction to revise the book again. It also affected the format of the book. She felt she could use a more literary writing style, provide more detail on historical incident, and omit the, the three-page section in the Snares of Saturn chapter, which spoke of Saturn's plan to destroy the church. This book, she felt, should be written for the world to read, not just the church. Those three pages were later reprinted for church members in Testimonies to Ministers, page 472 to 475. And uh, this is where the crisis now is that uh, the Great Conrovers has been edited and some things have been removed, and so we can't trust uh, the E.G. White estate. There are so many things that can be talked about the E.G. White estate, which are, which are true, and some are just false. You know, when even we are dealing with the falsehoods of some people, we should rightly represent them. The issue of just talking that this has been done, this has been done, and there is no witness or there is no uh, legit information on that should be avoided by anyone who calls themselves a Christian. The reason why some things were omitted in the time of E.G. White from her great controversy is because we were, or they were preaching about people coming into the church. And you could not put that in a print about the church, which is negative, and then invite people to that church. So it was eliminated and put into the testimonies to the church, which is a book for the church, so that the people of God may read it from there. But because this book was going to non-Adventist, it was needful that these things should be taken out of 
it. And so, Snares of Saturn taken out, the Great Condovers 1884 edition, chapter 27, pages 337 to 340 taken out. As the people of God approach the periods of the last day, Saturn holds earnest consultation with his angels as to the most successful plan of overthrowing their faith. He sees that the popular churches are already lulled to sleep by his deceptive power. By, pleading soft, by pleasing sophistry and uh, lying wonders, he can continue to hold them under his control. Therefore, he, decide, he directs his angels to lay their snares, especially for those who are looking for the second advent of Christ and endeavoring to keep all the commandments of God. Says the great uh, deceiver, we must watch those who are calling the attention of the people to the Sabbath of Jehovah. They will lead many to see the claims of the law of God and the same light which reveals the Sabbath reveals also the ministration of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary and shows that uh, the last work for man's salvation is now going forward. All the minds of the people in darkness till the work is ended and we shall secure the world and the church also. Now, the Sabbath is um, the Sabbath is um, the great question which is to decide the destiny of souls. We must exalt the Sabbath of our, of our creating we have caused it to be accepted by both worldlings and church members. Now the church must be led to unite with the world in its support. We must work by signs and wonders to blind their eyes to the truth and lead them to lay aside reason and the fear of God and follow custom and the tradition. I'll influence popular ministers to turn the attention of their hearers from the commandments of God. That which the scriptures declare to be a perfect law of liberty shall be represented as a yoke of bondage and so uh shifting to testimonies to ministers pages 472 to 475 she says the people accept their ministers explanation of scripture and uh, do not investigate for themselves therefore by working through the ministers i can control the people according to my will but our principal concern is to silence this sect of sabbath keepers we must exert popular indignation against them we will enlist great men and world wise men, worldly wise men upon our side and induce those in authority to carry out our purposes. Then the Sabbath which I have set up shall be enforced by laws the most severe and exacting. Those who disregard them shall be driven out from the cities and villages and made to suffer hunger and privation. When once we have the power, we will show what we can do with those who will not swerve from their allegiance to God. We led the Romish church to inflict imprisonment, torture, and death upon those who refused to yield to her decrees. And now that we are bringing the Protestant churches in the world into harmony with this right arm of our strength, we will finally have a law to exterminate all who will not submit to our authority. When death shall be made the penalty for of violating our Sabbath, then many who are now ranked with commandment keepers will come over to our side. But before proceeding to these extreme measures, we must exert all our wisdom and subtlety to deceive and ensnare those who honor the true Sabbath. We can separate many from Christ by wildness, lust, and pride. They may think themselves safe because they believe the truth, but indulgence of appetite or the lower passions, which will confuse judgment and destroy discrimination, will cause their fall. Go make the, go make the possessors of lands and money drunk with the cares of this life, Present the world before them in its most attractive light, that they may lay up their treasure here and fix their affections upon earthly things. We must do our utmost to prevent those who labor in God's cause from obtaining, uh, from obtaining means to use against us. Conclusion. Keep the money in our ranks. The more means they obtain, the more they will injure our kingdom by taking from us our subjects. Make them care more for money than for the upbuilding of Christ's kingdom and the spread of the truth we have. And we need not to fear for their influence. For we know that every selfish, covetous person will fall under our power and will finally be separated from God's people. Through those that have a form of goldness but know not the power, we can gain many who will otherwise do us harm. Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God will be our most effective helpers. Those of this class who are apt and intelligent will serve as decoys to draw others into our snares. Many will not fear their influence 
because they profess the same faith. We will thus lead them to conclude that the requirements of Christ are less strict than they once believed, and that by conformity to the world they will exert a greater influence with worldlings. Thus they will separate from Christ, then they will have no strength to resist our power, and ere long they will be ready to ridicule their former zeal and devotion until the great decisive blow shall be struck, our efforts against commandment keepers must be what? And tiring. And so, uh, Saturn continues with his meeting, his counsel, I'll have upon the ground as men as my agents, men holding false doctrines mingled with just enough truth to deceive souls. I'll also have unbelieving ones present once present, who will express doubts in regard to the Lord's messages of warning to his church. Should the people read and believe these admonitions, we could have little hope of overcoming them. But if we can divert their attention from these warnings, they will remain ignorant of our power and cunning, and we shall secure them in our ranks at last. God will not permit his words to be slighted with impunity. If we, keep, if we can keep souls deceived for a time, God's mercy will be withdrawn, and will give them what? He will give them up to our full control. We must cause destruction and division. We must destroy their anxiety for their own souls and lead them to criticize, to judge, and to accuse and condemn one another, and to cherish selfishness and enmity. For these sins, God banished us from his presence, and all who follow our example will meet a similar fate. Uh, uh, we carried the work through, although it cost a great effort. As we read, we found some things that were figurative expressions that were hard to translate and other things that were easy to be understood by the class of people to whom it was at first thought that the book would go. Expression familiar to Adventists and those who had heard their preaching, but which must be very blind to the ordinary reader, not... Um, not uh, and those who heard their preaching, but which must be very blind to the ordinary reader, not especially familiar with religious phrases. Again, we found parts of the subject that were very briefly treated because the reader was supposed to be familiar with the subject. Mother has given attention to all these points and has thought that the book ought to be so corrected and enlarged as to be of the most possible good to the larger number of promiscuous readers to whom it is now being offered. And as and she has taken hold with a remarkable energy to fill in some parts that are rather too brief. This is W. White, w. C. White letter to C. H. Jones, letter file A2, page 245. The 1884 edition had been written in a false, false foxy, easygoing style, but it was now discovered that such a idiomatic writings did not translate as well. In addition, the 1884 edition assumed that the reader was acquainted with many words and phrases common to Adventism. And so you see the material that was chopped off from the early edition, it was because the, the populace who are not Seventh-day Adventists were not familiar with Adventist history and uh, they were not familiar with the visions of Sister White. And so that brief accounts will not help them understand anything. And so, and this applied more so to Seventh-day Adventists more than it applied to Sunday keepers or the people of other churches. And so Will White says that it was needful that that part be taken out and enlarged in another volume that could be circulated to the people who are not familiar with uh, the Adventist uh, uh, message with the Adventist message but then uh, people take it uh, as uh, an affront people take it as uh, as if the book has been done something that should not be done on it more so uh, that um, uh, edition but uh, again we are told uh, just uh, a little backward. The Great Controversy of 1884 edition, those portions were left and then the 1888 edition was, uh, the 1884 edition was en enlarged. So 
what um, the Great Gondovers of 1884 edition, there are some things um, that were left out and then uh, there was an enlargement of the same. In the 1884 edition, for example, Haas and Jerome were allotted three pages. In the 1888 edition, 23 pages were devoted to the to their work and martyrdom. So you find that um, uh, in 1884, uh, as we went to the 1888 edition, actually uh, the three pages were left out and then the work was expanded so that the work that was only uh, how many pages, three pages in 1884 edition, in 1888 edition, now it was 23 pages. So that the people who are not familiar with Adventist history and the writings of Adventists may have in, uh, in fullness what was being spoken about. Several chapters were added, including the chapters on the French Re Reformation in the Netherlands and Scandinavia. Several other chapters were greatly enlarged. This will include the excellent study on obedience to the law of God in chapter 14 letter, English Reformers which was new material. This was um, a wholly new material that was being uh, placed in uh, 1888 edition. Now, continued on, we read that uh, In discussing the enlargement, Willie White noted that what they had discovered in Switzerland when they worked with translators, whereas the 1884 edition um, thusly explained the essential details, the 1888, which was to be later translated into a number of different languages, will have to include much more detail in order that the non-Adventist mind would understand it. For all to understand, uh, for mother's, mother's conduct with the European people had brought to her mind scores of things that had been presented to her in vision during the past years, some of them two or three times and other scenes many times. Her seeing of uh, historic places and her conduct with the people refreshed her memory with reference to these things, and so she desired to add much material to the book. This was done and the manuscripts were prepared for translation. After our return to America, a new edition was brought out much and large. That is 1888 edition. In this edition, some of the matter used in the first English edition was left out. The reason for these changes was found in the fact that the new edition was intended for worldwide circulation. In her public ministry, Mother has shown an ability to select from the storehouse of truth, matter that is well adopted to the needs of the congregation before her, and she has always thought that in the selection of matter for publication in her books, she best, the best judgment should be shown in selecting that which is best suited to the needs of those who will read the book. And uh, my memory doesn't serve me right, but um, we had two papers in Adventism, in Adventist history. I think, uh, I don't know if it is the review in the Herald that was for the church. And uh, when writing for the science of the time, the material that were in uh, um, Revere and Harald, um, actually, which applied to the church were cut off from that which was from the signs of the time. I, I don't recall much better, but uh, I think what was done in the Great Controversy book is the same thing that was being done in our papers. In that uh, one paper, it was more so for the people uh, in Seventh-day Adventists, and so it was restricted to that. But uh, the paper that was circulated to the people outside actually uh, the things that applied to the Seventh-day Adventist Church, they were chopped off from uh, that paper. Um, if you can just put, uh, if anyone have this history and can put it precisely in the comment section or on YouTube uh, page, uh, it will be better. But I think that is what happened with the two papers we had in, during the time of E.G. White. Not all papers were to serve everyone, but one paper was specifically for the church and another one was um, specifically for the people outside. And so the matters that were in-house were not to be uh, broadcasted abroad. 
and the matters that were for the abroad, everyone could be able to read it. And so let us look at uh, certain omissions. Again, continuing with these editions of the Great Controversy. Um, the Great Controversy 1888 edition. Notes and papers, page 165 to 166. This, this is what we are told of certain omission. Therefore, when the new edition of Great Controversy was brought out in 1888, when the new one was brought up out in 1888, uh, there were left out about 20 pages of matter four or five pages in a place which were very instructive to the Adventists of America, but which was not appropriate for readers in other parts of the world. Much of the research for historical statements used in the new European and American editions of, of Great Controversy was done in Basel, Switzerland, where we had access to Elder Andrew's large library and where the translators had access to the university libraries. This is... Um, uh, Willie White um, reporting about um, this um, mission and uh, having uh, having uh, having an access to um, the Jane Andrews uh, library and then um, uh, again uh, having access to the university library afforded them uh, uh, better opportunity to present things in the way that um, uh, they thought it would be better. On to 1911 edition, as uh, we try to summarize this about the Great Controversy. A powerful evidence that the text of the 1911 edition is practically the same as that of the 1888 edition is to be found in the fact that the paging of the 42 chapters in both books is identical. Turn to any page in those chapters and you will find essentially the same paragraphs. Thus, page 678 is the same in both books, yet it is the last page of the text as noted in point one above. It's nothing really different about the two editions. Yes, there is one major difference. It is the historical quotations. Ellen wrote the text and that is essentially unchanged. She also quoted from the Bible, and that is basically the same. But she also quoted from historians, and here we find very definite changes. Just what were these changes and why were they made? Ellen White concerned with presenting facts and principles. Ellen White was concerned with presenting facts and principles. But the way of the world is to use name dropping to confirm the reader. A writer will tell you that a fact or principle is important because a great man said so. In contrast, for Ellen, the power of a fact or principle was in it is inherent rightness, not because a certain historian said so. Because of this, when she quoted historians in the 1888 edition, she did not give their names. She did not consider it important to do so. In some cases, where a, st a historian has grouped together events as to afford in brief um, in brief what, um, a comprehensive view of the subject or has summarized detail in convenient manner, his words have been quoted, but in some instances, no specific credit has been given. And uh, we read that in the preface. I think uh, we read that in her preface on what she was doing, that um, the authority did not lie with uh, the writer but uh, the authority lay with the person or the author of that information which was god actually and so again she says that um, in some cases where a historian has so grouped together events as to afford in brief a comprehensive view of the subject or has summarized details in a convenient manner his words have been quoted but uh, in some instances, no specific credit has been given. Since the quotations are not given for the purpose of citing that writer as authority, but because his statement affords a ready and possible presentation of the subject. Great Controversy, 1888 edition, see 
1911 edition page um 12 and again how did she work how did she work selected messages page uh, 439 to 440 found also in our general missionary agents july 24 1911 Ellen White and some of her assistants began thinking of other factors that needed changing. Keep in mind that she always consistently considered Great Controversy to be her most important book. When I learned that uh, Great Controversy must be reset, I determined that we would have everything closely examined to see if the truth it contained was stated in the very best manner to convince those not of our faith that the Lord has guided and sustained me in writing of its pages. Letter 56, 1911. So, Willie White sent out letters of inquiry regarding other corrections that should be made. We took counsel with the men of the publishing department, with state conversing agents, and with members of the publishing committees, not only in Washington, but in California. And I asked them to kindly call our attention to any passages that needed to be considered in connection with the resetting of the book. And so this is how the 1911 edition was actually uh, carried out. This is how the 1911 edition was carried out. And uh, there were suggestions which were made about um, this book, the 1911 edition. There were suggestions that were made but um, she rejected. And let us see on this point what um, was it. Let us see on this point what uh, was suggested and why it was um, rejected. Now, suggestions rejected. One group of suggestions was, one group of suggestions was rejected. This came from W.W. Prescott who had a number of peculiar theories which he wanted inserted in, into Great Controversy. The present writer has found a number of incidents in which Prescott was not reliable, either in his thinking or in his accusations. Some of our readers may recall that Prescott was the one who wrote doubting letters about Ellen White, which the Spectrum and Ford liberals like to quote. Prescott did not like her because she would not accept his peculiar ideas, such as a novel theory about the 1260-year prophecy. Now, Willie White, her helper. As the work grew, others assisted me in preparing of matter for publication. After my husband's death, faithful helpers joined me, who labored untiringly in the work of copying the testimonies and preparing articles for publication. But the reports that are circulated that any of my helpers are permitted to add matter or change the meaning of the message I write out are not true. While we were in Australia, the Lord instructed me that Willie White should be believed, should be relieved from the many burdens his brethren will lay upon him, that he might be more free to assist me in the work the Lord has laid upon me. The promise had been given. I'll put my spirit upon him and give him wisdom. Since my return to America, I have several times received instructions that the Lord has given me, Willie White, to be my helper, and that in this work the Lord will give him of his spirit. Selected Messages, Book 1, page 50. And so, apart from uh, her rejecting, actually, what others proposed that uh, should be added in the Great Controversy, she was given assurance that she will have a helper in hand, and it will be none other than but um, her son, Willie White. And so, uh, just to wrap it up, we read that um, when the new book finally came off the press, the 1911 edition, Ellen White was very happy with it and read and read it. Much more information on changes between the two editions will be given in parts two and three of this uh, study. When the new book came out, she took great pleasure in looking over and reading it. Said Willie White, she was glad that the work we have done to make this edition as perfect as possible was completed while she was living. 
and could direct in what was done. Willie White, later, July 24, 1911. Um, see also Selected Messages, book three, page 437. And so uh, I'll be looking more into detail on this issue of uh, the various editions of the Great Controversy and uh, actually what was happening uh, in this uh, uh, in these editions that uh, were coming out because uh, many have doubted if uh, these editions, E.G. White ever sanctioned them or she never sanctioned them. In uh, letter 56, July 25, 1911, we read this. We read thus, the last slides, endorsement of the 1911 edition. July 25, 1911, Ellen White wrote a letter to Elder F.M. Wilcox, president of the Review Board and editor of the Review and Herald, in which she expressed satisfaction with the 1911 edition. Here is the complete letter. She says, and uh, I'll, I'll do something here, just... Uh, So that, um, yeah, that is it. And then uh, go back to my screen. Yes, dear brother Wilcox, a few days ago, I received a copy of the new edition of the book, Great Controversy, recently printed at Mountain View and also a similar copy printed at Washington. The book pleases me. I have spent many hours looking through its pages, and I see that the publishing houses have done good work. The book, Great Controversy, I appreciate above silver or gold, and I greatly desire that it shall come before the people. While writing the manuscript of Great Controversy, I was often conscious of the presence of the angels of God. And many times, the scenes about which I was writing were presented to me anew in visions of the night, so that they were fresh and vivid in my mind. Recently, it was necessary for this book to be reset because the electrotype plates were badly worn. It has cost me much to have this done, but I do not complain, for whatever the cost may be, I regard this new edition with great satisfaction. Yesterday, I read that Willie White has recently written to conversing agents and responsible men at our publishing houses regarding the latest edition of Great Controversy, and I think he has presented the matter correctly and well. When I learned that uh, great controversy must be reset, I determined that we would have everything closely examined to see if the truth it contained was stated in the very best manner, to convince those not of our faith that the Lord had guided and sustained me in the writing of its pages. As a result of the thorough examination by our most experienced workers, some changing in the wording has been proposed. These changes I have carefully examined and approved. I am thankful that my life has been spared and that I have strength and clearness of mind for this and other literary work. And so that is just a synopsis of the book, The Great Controversy. And uh, as we started by the preface, it is the struggle between Christ and his angels and Satan and his angels. The war is real and it will get more fierce as even we come to the end of the time. And so from the early edition to the 1911 edition, we find that um, she expounded more on uh, the things she had been shown, both old material and new material, until they were all combined in 1911 edition. But those things that belong to the church, particular Seventh-day Adventist church, they were taken out and uh, brought into testimonies to ministers and gospel workers. That, that is TM. And uh, that was um, the apostasy that will come direct in the church and uh, what Satan will do and his snares, if it were possible even to deceive the elect. And so as uh, we circulate this book, let us know that um, it is the book that she uh, valued above silver or gold. And uh, in her lifetime, she wished that that book should be circulated. And money 
should not be an excuse as we saw the excuses that people were giving, giving for not circulating this book. Right now we are on the verge of stupendous things happening in this world and what we need is the people to understand what is going around the world. We are not speculating of what is happening, but we have been given through the history that has been collected in the great controversy and the visions given to her. And we can be certain where we are headed in the time that we are living in. And so may the Lord bless us. As we shall continue to look on E.G. White biography and the battles she had to go through, we will discover that this war is real as the great controversy uh, she writes. And uh, sometimes the battles nearly killed her just because she was exposing the, the wiles and uh, the dark secrets of the enemy. And we cannot uh, pray for a better uh, outcome than what she faced. For those who live godly, they will suffer persecution. And as we reveal the dark secrets of the devil, let us know that um, uh, uh, he will not be our friend, but he will be our enemy. But one thing I can assure us is that uh, uh, I close with a verse in the book of John chapter 16, verses 33, uh, which is something that uh, should encourage us. Because we are in the great controversy and Satan is seeking to uh, do more harm than we ever think. He is rough knowing that his time here is short. Now we will be attacked more than even uh, the reformers and the prophets and the messengers that has gone before us were attacked. But I want to leave us with this encouragement as we pray. These things have I spoken unto you that it may that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. In uh, John chapter 14 verse 27 we are told, peace I live with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth you, give I unto you, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be uh, afraid. And then in Isaiah 26 in Isaiah 26 we are told um, verse 3 and for thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind he stayed on thee because he trusted in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. And our last text is Isaiah chapter 43, where we are told, uh, verses, uh, verses 1 and 2, Isaiah 43. The Bible records that, um, but now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I'll be with thee, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. As the Lord preserved those who wrote the Bible, the canonical writers, and he was able to preserve the non-canonical writers so he shall preserve his messengers in this end time as they deliver the messages that are to separate the chaff from the wheat. We are in the great controversy and may the Lord help us choose the side of the Lord rather than the side of uh, the enemy. Shall we uh, bow down for a word of uh, prayer? Our Lord, once again, we thank you that this is the war between Christ and his angels and Satan and his angels. And we are made spectacles in this war. The earth is the theater of this very issue. Lord, we pray that uh, amid the perils that uh, the two sides will uh, encounter, amid the war that uh, your children shall have a safe harbor when Christ is the captain and leading their lives. And so help us to surrender all, even though we may lose our life in this battle, but we know we can only fear that one who can take away our body and soul and not fear that who can take away our body only. Glory and honor be unto thy name and help us to have the character of thy son. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.